Well, good morning, Three Creeks. My name is Joel, and that, uh, those first 26 verses of John chapter 4, this is my favorite story about the life of Jesus. And in weeks one and two, we, we, we walked through that, and we talked about what Jesus was really doing with this woman at the well. And if you missed week one or week two, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to it or watch it wherever podcasts can be found. I think ours is there. And it will make this whole story, this, the most, my favorite story about Jesus and his life come alive. And here we are in week three. And as I shared in week one and two, the whole story in John 4 is 42 verses long. And so it just feels like a disservice to the story to try to wrap it up and share it in one or two weeks. And so we, we spread it out over four and we're moving through it like snails, just one or two verses at a time and asking God through the whole thing, God, what do you want us to learn through this story? There's so much in it. We could have done eight weeks or 12 weeks, but we made it four. And here we are in part three of the story. I found this interesting when I was uh, studying about this story. I, I was I read something that I'd never heard before about this woman and the impact that she has had now 2,000 years later. And, you know, you, you read up there, if you're, a, if you're a good reader, I'm not a great reader, but I, if you're following along, there's, Jesus essentially comes to this well and he says, can I have a drink? And she, first it catches her off guard and she goes, this, this doesn't make sense because you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan and that typically wouldn't happen. This is this is uncomfortable for everybody, but, it, but she does. She gives him this drink. And, and in Oaxaca, Mexico, they have a holiday in this city. It is on the fourth Friday of Lent. And on the fourth Friday of Lent every year, outside of churches and schools and businesses, people stand and they give away fruit drinks to passers-by, just like this woman did, did to Jesus at the well outside of Sychar on this day. And so you see, I'm actually going to share a little bit even more next week about the influence that this story, that this woman has had on all of us. And you just see this glimpse of generosity and kindness and uh, this story kind of permeating culture even today. I found that to be interesting. And all of this, all of this happening because Jesus, like I've emphasized a number of times, had to go through Samaria right? Jesus and his disciples are in the south. That's called Judea. They've got to make their way to the north. That's called Galilee. And in between them is Samaria. And so in John 4, 4, it says Jesus had to go through Samaria. But what we have found out is that he didn't have to go through Samaria. He could have taken the outer, he could have taken the outer belt, 270, if you will. That's what every other God-fearing Jew would have done. He would have taken the Via Maris or the Transjordan Highway and avoided Samaria at all costs because Jews and Samaritans despise each other. They don't interact. And so at seven or eight or ten different levels, this interaction that Jesus is having with this woman at the well, it just blows people's minds for so many reasons. To get them all, you got to go listen to week one and two. I'm not going to get into it too much today, but you got to know that this was crazy. There was a woman who was coming to the well at noon outside of a village called Sychar in Samaria, and Jesus had to go there to make sure that she knew that he loved her. When they got there, I don't know if you noticed this in the first couple of verses, when they got there, after traveling, Jesus and his disciples, it says they were weary from the long journey. And the disciples ran into town to go get some food. And Jesus stayed at the well because he knew what was about to happen at the well. And so he stayed there and he was thirsty. And so he says, can I have a drink of water? And the disciples are hungry. And so there's this collective, you know, hangriness probably among them, right? Where they're, they're, they're worn out and they're tired and they're hungry. And that is the, the conditions under which this whole story happens. And Jesus asks her for a drink. And at first it catches her off guard. She says, Jews aren't supposed to associate with Samaritans. How could you be asking me for a drink? And Jesus talks to her, I don't know if you caught it, about living water. You drink from the water that I give you, you will never thirst again. He's talking about eternal life. And this woman's reply to that offer is, well, 
the Messiah is going to come one day and he will be able to offer me eternal life, but that's coming a day in the future. And Jesus in verse 26 says, I, the one who you are talking to, am he. And Jesus begins to reveal himself as the Redeemer, as the Savior, as the long-awaited Messiah. And it's interesting to me, the first group of people that, all, that Jesus always reveals him to, himself to are not the people that you and I would probably reveal ourselves to if we wanted to get famous. He, 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 he goes to people that he thinks, that everybody else would think, that, that's probably not where you start. And he goes to this woman at the well, this woman who's socially outcast and ceremonially unclean, and he says, living water, eternal life on the table. I, the one you are speaking to, am the person that you've been waiting for. And if you believe in me, everything will change. So what happens next? Here we are, part three of the story. We're not going to do too much today, just maybe seven or eight verses. And this is what happens in verse 27. So remember, they just, him and this woman have just had this conversation about the worst mistakes that she's ever made in her life. And then she tries to change the subject and talk about theology and he gives her an answer that she doesn't understand, and she just tries to kind of kick the conversation down the road, doesn't want to talk about it, and he says, he just kind of draws a line in the sand. He goes, listen, I'm the Messiah. I'm the person that you've been waiting for, and this is what happens next. Verse 27, just then, right when this is happening, the disciples returned, and they were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? You see, over the course of the last year or so that these disciples have been following Jesus around, they have seen Jesus interact with all sorts of people. And so while it was surprising to them that Jesus was talking to a woman by himself, Jesus is a rabbi, so you wouldn't even talk to a woman anyways, but he's talking to a Samaritan woman by himself in the middle of the day at noon, and the whole thing catches the disciples by surprise but they don't challenge Jesus on it, even though they don't know what he's doing. They know he's probably doing something. They've seen people challenge Jesus before, and it usually doesn't go very well. So, verse 28 says, Then, this is what the woman does. Leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did including all the secrets that nobody else knows about. This man has told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of town and they made their way towards him. So the clock is ticking. Once again, Jesus does something that's going to draw a crowd, even though that wasn't his intent. But she goes back and says, listen, this guy's like a fortune teller. You got to come and see this magician you got to come and figure out, is this guy really the Messiah? Come help me figure this out. And because her story is so compelling, all the people start making their way out towards the well. And the clock is ticking, but Jesus has something that he wants the disciples to know before the crowd gets there. This is a personal conversation. It's not for everybody. It's just for them. He doesn't use this in a speech anywhere else. This is, this is for his closest friends. This is what he says. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And his disciples said to each other, they're confused. Could somebody have brought him food? And Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Remember, Jesus is hungry, and one of the disciples had the forethought. They were ordering food, and somebody said, hey, we got to remember, we got to get one to go for Jesus, because he's not here with us, and he's hungry. He's got to be hungry. So one of the disciples was so thoughtful that he ordered two of whatever they were having, and he transported it out thoughtfully to Jesus, and they said, Rabbi, eat something. <laughs> Jesus says, no thanks. And he says, I've got some food you don't know anything about. 
And the disciples are like, what are you talking about? And why are you saying it in code? Just tell us, how did you eat? And Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. It wouldn't have been wrong. This is important to understand. It wouldn't have been wrong for Jesus to eat the food, to take it, say, thank you. Thanks for thinking of me. And eat the food. It wouldn't have been wrong. But Jesus wanted to use this moment, this moment where he was in need, where he was desperate for something. He wanted to use that moment to make a point and help his disciples understand that in this life, in our lives, on the earth, Three Creeks, I'm, I'm, I, I really need you to get this with me today. That in this life, on this earth, there's nothing more satisfying than doing the will of God, than being part of the work of God. That's what Jesus is saying. He chooses this illustration of food in this moment with his disciples when everybody's hungry and it wouldn't be wrong to eat the food. He says, all I need, what satisfies me the most is to do the will of God and to finish the work that God has put before me. See, in all of our lives, this is interesting, in all of our lives, as we generally go about things, we want to understand something before we experience it, right? We want to, we want to get the answers. We want to figure it out. We want to understand how it works before we go and experience it. But so much of the Bible, <laughs> I don't know if I could say all the Bible because I haven't thought through the whole thing, but a lot in the Bible, that's flipped. It's you get to experience something or you take a step to experiencing something before you can fully understand it. So much of faith is that. It's taking a step and on the other side realizing, man, what took me so long? Now I can see it. Sometimes in our faith journey, like we don't get to see or feel how it will feel on the other side until you take the step. And that makes me uncomfortable. I want to know what I'm getting myself into. I want to know what it's going to feel like. But the way that faith works in these stories in the Bible, so often it's you've got to experience it before you begin to understand it. And then you can try to explain it to somebody else who hasn't done it yet. And they're like, I don't get it. And you're like, yeah, I know. But if you do it, you'll get it. And what Jesus is saying is that there's nothing more satisfying than doing the will of God. And each one of us, each one of us, wakes up every morning looking to be satisfied, looking to be fulfilled, looking to find joy, looking to find peace, looking to do something that matters. And Jesus uses this moment with these disciples to explain to them that nothing will make you feel like, like, like that, like you want to feel satisfied, like doing the will of God. He chooses that moment to live differently. So see if you can track with me here. A couple weeks ago, I was sitting in a meeting with a bunch of Gehanna pastors, and actually, Lori, I believe you were even there at this meeting, and we were going around, and every pastor got to kind of share, here's what's going on in our church, here's what we're teaching through, here's what's going on, give us an update, we encourage each other, we pray for each other, it's once a month, and I love being there. And it comes to me, this is this October meeting, right? So about a month ago. And it comes to me, and I say, guys, we are going to try to do this thing called the well, we're going to try to raise a million dollars over three years in gifts and pledges. We're going to try to think less church offices and more ministry center, a place that a lot of groups can come and go, and we can introduce people to Jesus and life in this place. This is, this is what we're trying to do, but we're going to try to raise a million dollars. And, uh, you know, there's a general like, oh, cool, like they're excited for us. They encouraged me. They prayed for us. And one guy named Rob, uh, he said, man, now is a great time to try to raise money. And everybody at the table, like, we, we laughed because he thought he was kidding. We thought it was a joke. We thought he was being sarcastic. And he said, no, 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 I'm, I'm actually serious. And we're like, I went and got coffee, and it was like $6. So try to explain to me what you mean here, Rob. And he said, think about it. 
Has there ever been a time in our lives when someone who thinks of the kingdom first can stand out more than right now? He said, Christians right now have a chance to look so differently. He said, the light shines brightest in the darkness. There, there's, and he just goes on to explain that the time is right now for somebody who's living for something bigger than what everybody else is living for can stand out. And I just, I, you know, I'm racking my brain going, man, but the interest rates and the inflation and the election and I don't even know what mutual funds are, but I'm, I don't think they're good right now. <laughs> and the economy with the way that it is, and gas with the way that it is, and I just wanted to say, Rob, are you kidding me? It feels like it would be better to try to do a capital campaign when everybody's pockets are loaded with cash. But I think, God, I think Rob's right. Because if we're living with the world in mind, this is nuts. Doesn't make mathematical sense. But if we believe that the most satisfying thing in the world is to do the will of God, then it makes all the sense in the world. There's really two filters through which we can make this decision. On an individual level, the church, like on a leadership level, we've made the decision to kind of go for this, right? But on an individual level, there's two filters through which we're going to make this decision. We're going to either make this decision with a faith filter or a fear filter. And if we make it through a fear filter, fear, <laughs> did I just make up a word? Fear filter, everybody else is freaking out. Everybody else is wondering how, are the interest rates going to keep going up? Is inflation going to keep going up? Who's going to get elected? Everybody's losing their minds. If we make our decision with a fear filter of what could happen, or we flip it over to the other side and we go, we're going to make this decision through a faith filter and go, I know God, and everything I know that, to be true about God doesn't change because it's November 2022. He hasn't changed ever. And I know he'll take care of me, and I know that he's faithful to me, and I know that he won't let me down. And I know that he'll never leave me. So, so really, this is an opportunity for a church, a group of Christians to do something more. It's like Jesus in that moment when he was hungry. He chose that moment to live differently to prove a point. And I think right now, just not just at Three Creeks, but also across the United States, across the world, when things are uneasy, when everybody else is really worried about what's going to come next, a Christian who has hope in Jesus and who has hope in a God that cares for them, man, you just handle those things differently. And so I do believe that our church has a unique opportunity to stand out and, and, and just be radically different than how everybody else is handling this. I, I, I've hit on this a couple times, that Jesus had to go through Samaria, right? And so far, I've talked for two and a half sermons with the idea in mind that Jesus had to go through Samaria because he had to go meet that woman. He had to go make sure that that woman knew that he loved her. But what we're finding out in this little conversation with Jesus and the disciples is that he had to go through Samaria. He was compelled to do this, not just for her, but also to his closest followers. He had something that he needed to teach them at the well at Sychar. And he wasn't going to have another opportunity like this to teach them. And so, yes, it, while, while Jesus had to go through Samaria to go to that woman and make sure that she knew, somebody that didn't know him, she knew that he was the Messiah. Yes, but also Jesus had to go through Samaria because he wanted to teach his disciples something too. He didn't want them to miss out on this truth that he was trying to share with them. In the same way, in the same way, friends, that I, I believe, obviously, that the well is going to be a place where people are going to come to know who Jesus is. They're going to put their faith in him. They're going to connect to people who love God. And it's going to be a life-altering experience. We're going to see hundreds, maybe thousands of people come to find out where the living water is really at, at the well. And so I believe, obviously, that 
God's going to do something through us. But I also believe that in this process that God wants to do something in us. That yes, this well is proverbially for the woman, for people who aren't in here right now, who don't necessarily know who Jesus is and how much God loves them. Yes, but it's also for the disciples. It's also for the people that already know who he is. And so yes, God's going to do something through us, but he, he wants to do something in us too. And so the question that I have for you on a very personal level is, what does God want to teach you through this? What does God want to do? What does God want to do in us through this process? Because somebody could come and just write a check for a million bucks and drop it in the bucket. And if somebody wants to do that, that'd be fine. But (laughs) somebody could do that. But if somebody did that, I think we'd have to throw away all the brochures that you got on your way in here and we'd have to print some new ones, and we'd have to make it say like two million. Because I don't want us, us on individual levels, to miss out on the chance to see more of who God is and how generous he is, and I don't want us to miss out on what he wants to do in us. This whole thing started in my mind. I'm just going to be honest. It felt like a fundraiser. And I had a conversation, I, don't, I, haven't, I didn't write this down, I, I just feel like I'm supposed to share this. I had a conversation with somebody a couple months ago, and I, I put out all of my, the well stuff in front of him. I said, what do you think about this? And this guy's a professional fundraiser. He actually is a real fundraiser. And I put it all out in front of him. I said, what do you think, Tim? And I thought he was going to be so proud of me. And he said, he just kind of pushed it back. He said, well, it's okay. I'm like, Tim. Come on, like we're literally meeting so that you can encourage me here. And uh, he, he just pushed it back. He used to be a pastor. And he said, yeah, you know, if the Lord wants you to get it, you'll get it. But what's going to happen to the hearts of your people through this? And that's all I needed to say. The meeting was essentially over. I don't even know what we talked about from that point forward. Because he was so right. What's going to happen to the hearts of the disciples through this? It's not just about what God wants to do through us, but what God wants to do in us. So this whole thing has changed from being a fundraiser to being a, are our hearts fully surrendered? And do we believe that the most satisfying thing in the world would be to do the will of God? I want to throw out... uh, Ah, you know what? I don't, I don't think I'm going to do that. I, I, maybe I'll share that with you another time. <laughs> Here's the bottom line. A million bucks is a lot of money. It, it is a lot. And <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about this the other day. I was, I was thinking about what if we got it? You know, what if we all rallied, sacrificed together? We added up, oh man, we did it like as a church what a deal, we're moving forward, our next step, like what if we did that, and the next week, next week, uh, so I guess next week is November 13, Commitment Sunday, on November 20, I roll into the parking lot in a brand new Tesla. (laughs) The next week after that, fat Rolex on the wrist, I buy some kind of Gucci man bag that I start sporting around, you look at next year's budget, it's set, there's $75,000 set aside for the down payment for the elder's yacht. <laughs> <laughs> you see me courtside at the Cavs games, Instagram every night, and I get there with my private jet that I need for ministry. I'm just asking, how would you feel about that? <laughs> Here's how I think you'd feel. You'd never come back to our church. You'd never give another dollar to Three Creeks. And you might not give a dollar to any church ever. (laughs) 
And you might press charges. And really, at the core, deep inside, you would be saying, they're wasting it. That was not my intent. They're not doing what they said they were going to do. They, uh, and, and clearly, like maybe at the deepest level, the, the feeling is clearly they care about different things than me. We are not on the same page about what we care about. I think that's how you'd feel. And I just got to throw this out there. How is that really any different than the way that God looks at us in the way that we are spending the money that he gave to us? Think about that for a second. Theologically, I believe, and the Bible says that everything that I have is really his, that I'm, I'm the conduit through which he's wanting to change and bless the world. So everything I have is from him. And, it, and as, as angry as you would be at me or our elders, whoever's spending our money, as angry as you would be if, if I rolled in here featured on Preachers and Sneakers, as angry as you would be, I'm just asking the question, how is that different than the way that God would look at us spending the money that he's given to us to use to bless people and change the world and tell people about him? And so the, the simple question, I'm not here to pick apart your personal budget. I'm not here to tell you what's valuable and what's not and where you should go on vacation. I'm not, it's not what I'm saying. I'm just asking a question. Is it clear in your life that you care about the same things that God does? Is it so clear based on how you're spending your money that you care deeply about the same things that God cares deeply about? Would you look at your credit card report and look at the way that you're spending your money and go, yes, this person is playing the part that I've asked them to play in growing my kingdom on the earth. I approve it was my intent for them to do those things? Or would it be on the other side? And, and, and I just got to ask, like, are you using what God has given you, given you well in a way that God would say, yes, they care deeply about the things that I care deeply about? Let me close with this. A million bucks is a lot of money. I think I already said that, right? It's a lot. But this should give you a lot of encouragement. This isn't my first capital campaign that I have ever led. I led another one. In the summer of 2012, at Beulah Beach Camp, there were 195 middle schoolers. And uh, that was my first one. So I've got a lot of experience. That one and now this one. And that was in 2012... And 195 middle schoolers got together, and we, we showed them. It was, it was week six. It was the last week of our six-week sprint through camp. And we showed them a couple different options. We showed them like a $200 level option that was going to buy like four bunk beds for an orphanage. And then there was a $400 option that was like, oh, twice as many bunk beds for this orphanage. And then there, I think there was a $600 option that was like, man, you guys could buy, I think, 12 bunk beds for this orphanage in Africa. And, and the middle schoolers got together with their counselors and they said, we want to raise $1,000. And I was like, guys, like this, the high schoolers, they only raised 600, okay? So we're going to have to tone down some of your expectations and we're not going to be able to do 1,000. And they said, no, we want to do $1,000. I said, guys, there's no shame in 500 bucks. You guys could raise $500. We could buy like 10 bunk beds. Wouldn't that be amazing? And the counselors and the campers got together and they voted again against me. They voted me down. <laughs> and they said, we want to raise $1,000. And in my mind, I went to, how am I going to spin this? When we find out we only raised so much, how am I going to spin this so that nobody's real demoralized and I can still encourage them and say they did a good job? It's immediately where I went to. And some of the excuses that I, that I started to make, here, here, here were some of them. I don't even know if they have $1,000. 
because they're at camp and they can't even go home to get more money. So what they have, I literally don't even know if they have $1,000. And then I thought, this is the last night at camp. They probably spent all of it on the snack shack Sunday through Wednesday. And so they definitely don't have $1,000. They, they love the snack shack way too much for this to actually work. And then I thought, they're so young. They are so young. Maybe if they were older and they had jobs and they were like making some money, I could maybe see this like working, but they're just too young and they love the snack shack too much. And I don't even know if they have it. But we went for it anyways. And last night at camp, and there was, a, there was a, a palpable sense of the Spirit of God in this place. And we talked about trying to buy all these bunk beds. And they passed the buckets, and kids are reaching into their gym shorts, pulling out Ziploc bags full of like $1 bills and change. And I still didn't know if they had $1,000, but they were all in. I couldn't believe it. Like every kid reaching in their pockets, pulling open the Ziploc bag, dumping it in. I couldn't believe it. And so we gathered it all. We got the, all the buckets and we went to the back of the pavilion and there were two picnic tables back there. And, you know, over here they were like counting some of the buckets and over here some of the buckets and, you know, stack up the 20s, the 10s, the 5s, the 1s quarter stacks, penny stacks, all of it, right? We're just, we're stacking it up. And one of the counselors is going around with a calculator and he's going, okay, 20s over here and 10s, okay, adding it up. And, uh, and I was sitting over at the table back right, I guess. And uh, he came over and he's kind of adding it up. And he said, he, he said, and how many pennies are there? And I said, I counted them. There's 78 and this was the last, I didn't see it. This is the last moment. We're going to find out how much it is. And he hits plus 0.78 equal sign. And his eyes just got big. And he showed it to me. And it said, one, zero, 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 dot, zero, zero. And I'm not making it up. And I couldn't believe it. And I would... I would venture to say that's the most unbelievable thing maybe I've ever seen in my life. That all these middle schoolers that love the snack shack, that didn't even have $1,000, I don't even know where it came from. They all went all in and it added up to $1,000, not a penny more, not a penny less, and nobody rigged it. I was there, nobody rigged it. So that was pretty cool to go back in there and tell them. <laughs> right? I mean, it, it was the most, it was the most unbelievable ministry moment that I've ever had. And I just, it was just because these kids, they were willing to forsake the snack shack and what they felt like God wanted them to do was to give this money to buy these bunk beds. That's it. And they just said, I'm in. And for all of those kids, 195 of them, the most satisfying thing in the world in that moment was doing the will of God. I, I, I want to invite you. This is the end, okay? I want to invite you. If, if this is your church home, if you're listening to this or if you're watching this, if this is your church home, I want you to wrestle with God this week. I want it to be intense. I want to give you the freedom to wrestle with him. I want, to, I want you to wrestle proverbially with your spouse about this if you're married. I, want, I don't want this to be like, oh yeah, it's Sunday again, like, and come back. I want you to take time this week and wrestle with God. Here are a couple conversations I had this week. I had a conversation with somebody who one of the spouses just lost their job. And they still want to make a commitment, but they don't know what to do. I want you to wrestle if that's you. I, I talked to somebody else who said, our income is likely to change dramatically in the next 12 months. What do you want us to do? I don't know the answer to that. I want you to wrestle. I want to give you the freedom to feel like you can wrestle with God. I talked to somebody this morning who said, 
we're still not there. Me and my wife, we're still working on it. We don't agree yet. And I want to give you the permission, the freedom, the invitation to wrestle with God and say, God, what do you want me to do? What part do you want me to play? And ultimately, God, is, is what you want me to do, is it going to be enough that you can teach me something? Is it going to be enough that it has the potential to move the needle of my faith? Because like I said a couple times, five or 10 minutes ago, yes, God wants to do something through us and the well's going to be incredible. But in the process, what does God want to do in us? As you wrestle with God and as you land on your number, I want you to ask God at the, at the very end, go, God, is this enough that you can teach me everything you want to teach me through this? Because I, I just want everybody to not miss out on the opportunity not to be a part of a fundraiser, but to have your heart transformed and to get to know more about God and his generosity and his favor, and he is going to protect you no matter what happens. This is one of the, the great joys in, in being a Christ follower is that he's got us all the way. And church, I just hope that as we kind of take this step together, that we will experience it and then begin to understand that the most satisfying thing in the world is doing the will of God. So next week's going to be great. I'm really excited for it, and I hope that you'll join us for it. And I hope that from now until next week that you will feel the freedom to wrestle with God about what he wants you to do, and you'll experience freedom on the other side.